I am Polygroid and you are learning at Impolygroid channel. Enjoy and have a great time. A little entertainment. But not on the principle of escapism. But on the principle of affirmation. And there's scarcely a more affirmative artist in, ah, uh, the musical world than my old friend. Whom I'm going to bring out now. On the theory that music hath charms. To soothe the savage breast. And because he is. Past all question. One of the greatest influences. Ah, uh, in American music. And the greatest influence. In jazz of all time. It's my, great pleasure. To bring you my great friend. Louis Armstrong. The whole world. Embraced Louis Armstrong. He was bringing a gift. The gift of a presentness. And a naturalness and a depth of insight. And the ability to act. On those insights in the moment. And it was in a difficult form like music. And that type of electric virtuosity. Has not been seen before or since. Without him. Many things that happen today in jazz. Would not be possible. And I think that Mr. Armstrong. Has not gotten a good deal. Of the credit that's due to him. He has been. The number one man in his department. He is really the ambassador. Of the whole thing. So there will never. Be another one like this. Well, he was a very, very deep person. He was very much aware. Of world activities. What was happening everywhere. We would have our discussions at home. He had been asked. By many reporters in interviews. What did he think? About a certain particular thing. And Lewis would say, well, man. You know, I'm just a musician. He never would come out publicly. Because his, ah, uh, theory was that. What I say carries a lot of weight. And he says, and I just won't do it. But at home, he had his opinions. American people. They the most grandest people on earth. And I'm from America. Well, quite naturally. I don't have no fucking flag. Other than a black flag. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Now I'll be glad when you're dead. You rascal you. I'll be glad when you're dead. You rascal you. Boy, when you're laying six feet deep. No more fried chicken will you eat. Oh, you dog. I know that'll break your heart. My father would say. You have to check Pops out. I was going, man, I don't want Pops. In New Orleans, too. Where so much what we call. Uncle Tomming, goes on. Playing Dixie, shuffling. In my time, I hated that. With an unbelievable passion. When I was growing up. There was no way for me to even express. The type of anger and hatred I had. Toward that type of behavior. So, I could not appreciate Armstrong. But when I left New Orleans. And I was in New York at that time. My father sent me a tape. He said, man, why don't you learn? One of these pop solos? So I put it on. And I started to work on it. Man, I could not play this solo at all. Just the endurance. Of of Louis Armstrong. He never stopped playing. He was always up around high B's. And when we got to the final chorus. I, I called my father. I said. Man, I didn't understand about pops. He just started laughing. He said, that's right. Lewis loved his home in Queens. Some people said. That it wasn't palatial enough. And he didn't want to move anywhere else. When tape came on the scene. Lewis became enamored of that. And he used it most of all. For conversations. He had friends come to the house. And he would tape it. Lewis had a lot of what. I would describe as archival materials. I mean, tapes and and things like that. He had his own study. It was taboo to everyone. That was his. He'd close that door. And nobody bothered him. He had his tapes. And everything of his was in there. I've heard a lot of. 
reel to reels of pops just talking. Everyday life recordings. His humanity comes through. I got tapes on my wall in my den. For 40 years, Lucille had. One of them Tanbergs. Put up there with two tapes together. That really knocked me out. Because we couldn't afford no den. In, uh, them early days. No, we've gotta sleep in that room. Now you got a den. Now I got a den. I got all of my tapes around the walls. And just pick out what I wanna hear. He was the busiest person. Taking care of things when he was home. It was his relaxation. He would sit up in his study. For hours and hours. Indexing his tapes. And he has a hobby. Of cutting out pictures. You know, and paste them up on the ceiling. In his den, all over the walls. I've got scrapbooks that Lewis had. That were made up when he first played. The Palladium back in 32. Most of the pictures and the newspaper. Write-ups have gone yellow. People asked all the time. Why is he recording these tapes? Why is he writing down? All of his thoughts? And all this kind of stuff. He knew that one day they were gonna. Write about him in the history books. And so he wanted to make sure. All sides of him good, bad, ugly. Were gonna be captured. And preserved by himself. Not by anybody else. Hello, folks. This is old Louis Satchmo Armstrong. I just finished this concert here and, ah. Uh, I feel good cause, ah. Uh, I had a nice supper of wiener schnitzels. Ah. Uh, glad to see you around. And, ah, uh, dig the concerts. We've been playing every night. Around the neighborhood cities. So, later. Goodbye. Louis Armstrong is. The Prime Minister of the World of Jazz. He and his trumpet are at the summit. His European concerts. Have broken all records. Satchmo is one of our more valuable items. For export. His recordings are hot. On both sides of the Iron Curtain. Satchmo. You always draw an audience, don't you? Yeah, man. That shows you. There's cats in all walks of life. He broke so many barriers. He would be the first black performer. To open up a club. A ballroom, a radio station. He was the first black movie performer. To have his name above the title. Don't you ever get tired? Well, daddy. I'm just a little beat from my youth. You had quite a session here tonight. Yeah, we just start playing it the same. As we did in the tailgates in New Orleans. MMHMM. -M -M. It's the same music. And it's, uh, universal, daddy. Yes, way down yonder in New Orleans. Man, you should have made. All those scenes. Just saying, hello, folks. Over a microphone sounds simple. And innocent, doesn't it? But I remember when it wasn't so simple. Back in 1931. I was invited to play in my hometown. New Orleans, at a fancy nightclub. The suburban gardens. You spent a lot of time. In New Orleans, in the south. Looking for signs. You see a restroom that said. White gentleman. This always was a put down. So, you saw that flashing. In your face all the time. The only way. Lewis would agree to go to New Orleans. Was on his own private train. Which meant that we could have. Our private car, our cooks. Chefs, porters and things like that. In New Orleans, we're, quite naturally. The first band on the radio down there. Fleischmann's Yeast presents. Another great half hour of entertainment. Featuring music by Louis Armstrong. And his orchestra. And you never heard. Of no spade playing on no radio. In those days. Just starting. The night we opened. There's all the white boys. That I was raised with, you know. Sitting up there, sharp. They done got rich. Maybe their fathers done left them the. The produce places and different things. That when we was kids. 
We used to hang around. And after school, we'd go out in the lots. And play cowboys and Indians. With old broken slates. And things like that. You know what I mean? We. MMHMM. We was the Indians, of course. And at that time. There was no mixing of the races at all. The only way. Our people could hear the band. Was to come out. And sit along the levee and hear. And hear the music from the. From a distance. They had 50,000 Negroes. On the levee to hear my music. See, and I had been away. About nine or ten years. And, uh, I done got northern fied. I done forgot about a whole lot of. That foolishness down there, you know? The night we're opening, and I'm charming. And there's place pack and jam. But this night, they done brought. This man up to, it's a big deal, now. You you bring on Louis Armstrong. He's a New Orleans boy. And blah, blah, blah. But, a second before. This cat had to go to that mic. And bring me on, he walked away. Say, I just can't introduce that nigger. Can't do it. They got me and told me what he says. I said, well, don't worry about it. You know? I said, give me that card, boys. And I walked to that mic. And when I went into. Pale moon shining. Man, you thought the walls was coming in. Now the pale moon's shining. On the fields below. The folks are crooning soft and low. You needn't tell me, boy. Because I know, yes. When it's sleepy time down south, yes. And this announcer's standing there. He said, I didn't know this would happen. In the south in New Orleans. Never happened before. So, they fired him and everything. And I took over myself. Good evening, everybody. It was particularly galling. For him to go home. After being lionized the way he was. Around the world. And see the same type of prejudice. His feelings were perpetually hurt. By the nation. And the injustice that he knew. When he was a boy. Pops grew up very hard. It's been said, Pops. That you were brought up. In abject poverty. You didn't have money. When you were a kid, though. We always had money. I could shoot craps, sold newspapers. And I always hustled on the, ah. Uh, with the quartet and a little guitar. Just sit and go busking. And I always had a pocket full of money. You know, in 1915, you had five dollars. You had a whole lot of money. And I didn't ever have. To beg nobody for nothing all my life. Always a kid that had. Some get up about him. I was born in, ah. Uh, in James Alley, they called it. It's, ah, uh, back of town. That's the the real New Orleans. We have a photo of your mama. I wanna show everybody. Yeah. That's my mother there, Mayan. How did she discipline you? What did she do? When you did something wrong? She had to whip the hell out of us both. And, man, she hit me like a man. And then she married Willie Armstrong. I mean, I'm only going by. What they tell me along that line. Cause as long as I can remember. They wasn't together. We didn't have much money. And things like that. But we lived and, ah. Uh, enjoyed good food. And. You had a lot of fun? Yeah. My mother could take 15 cents. And go to the Poydras market. And come back and cook a meal. And you had to lick your fingers. It was just so good. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. For 15 cents? In those days, you could take a newspaper. And I'd go to the fish market. And buy a whole newspaper. Full of fish heads. Just plain, chopped off fish heads. That, ah. Uh, they wouldn't use, they put aside. Yeah. That'd be garbage for them, wouldn't it? 
Well, they just ain't got time. To do what we did with. Yeah. My mother would get them fish heads. And cook them. And put a lot of canned tomatoes in them. And call it court bouillon. And serve it on top of some rice. Boy, you talking about beautiful food. And delicious. And the next morning. I'd go to school with a cabbage sandwich. Kids would be begging for a bite. No kidding? Absolutely. Yeah. New Orleans was a stomping ground. Well, they played every type of music. Everyone, no doubt, had a different style. They had every class. We had Spanish. We had colorids. We had whites. I was working. For some Jewish people at seven years old. They had, uh, a rags and bones yard. And then we used to go down. To the red light district. And deliver stone coal. Five cents a water bucket. I've got those coal cart blues. I'm really all confused. I'm bout to lose my very mind. It always worry, worry me all the time. The center of entertainment in New Orleans. Was Storyville. The notorious red light district. The Negroes were only allowed to work in the red light district. Most of the help was Negroes. They were paid good salaries and had a long time job. The pay was swell. No matter what your vocation was. No mixing at the guest tables at no time. As far as to buy a little trim. That was absolutely out of the question. Down in the district. The red light district as you call them, prostitutes. Where they get five dollars for a job. The whores where I'm talking about. Up in my neighborhood. They get, uh, fifty cents to a dollar. Well, quite naturally. They're standing there with nothing on. But a a chemise. We'd call them teddies at the time. You know. So, there I'd be, a little boy. And put some coal on the grates, you know. Quite naturally. You gotta take a mug there right quick. If they'd seen me. They'd have slapped me down. Yeah, I actually did all that. But I I used to hear. All that good music too. That's how I got a chance. To hear Bunk Johnson. Manuel Perez, and all the best bands. And everything, you see? They were all in the red light district? Yeah, they each corner had a band. Cabarets, they called them, see? And we'd dance. And I'd be waving at them all. And when they'd go inside. We had to go to bed and sleep. New Year's Eve, 1912. Lewis and his pals were out on the street. And they were celebrating. And making noise like everybody else. And somehow. Lewis got hold of A. 38 revolver. I found this pistol. Ah, uh, got blanks in it. But the noise is what everybody give you. So when I look around. A little guy was shooting. A little old six shooter. Across the street. Ah, uh, you know. So, I was singing in a little quartet. You know. We used to go around. And pass the hat, you know. And they called me Dipper at that time. Dipper mouth, you know. They say, get him, Dipper. And I reached up there. To grab the. 38 and. And brighten it up. Until that detective was hugging me. And and I said, oh. In those days. The cops would whip your head. And then ask you your name afterwards. You know? And, ah, uh, you think. That's something that's, uh, changed? Well, I haven't been down there. In so long. I'm gonna go down and see. And I couldn't get away from him. He took me down to the juvenile court. And, uh, then, the next day. They took me out to the orphanage. It it was called. Colored Waves Home for Boys. When was the first time in your life? That you actually picked up a horn? Oh, that was, ah, uh, you know. When I went to the orphanage. I was about 13. 
This is the first horn that Louis Armstrong ever owned. We did not have much money, but we are proud of encouraging him. The little brass band was very good, and Mr. Davis made the boys play a little of every kind of music. When he first arrived at your home, could you tell right away he wanted to be a musician? We could, yes. How could you tell that? Because he organized quartets, singing, MMHMM. Then he introduced dancing out there, tap dancing. The boys would clap and sing, and he'd sing and dance. Then when I did get him to play, when the saints go marching in, put on your old gray bonnet. There was a high note to be out on, because it was at the end of the strain. Yeah. None of the other boys couldn't make it. And I couldn't make it myself. MMHMM. But he would blow the high C. Above the staff. To let us know. That's the end of the strain. Every day I practiced faithfully. On the lessons Mr. Davis gave me. I became so good on the cornet. That one day Mr. Davis said to me. Lewis, I'm going to make you leader of the band. I jumped straight up into the air. You see, what people don't understand, in New Orleans, the majority of the musicians haven't had the opportunity of having a teacher, and they only pick up an instrument and just fool around with it until they begin to try to get some kind of tone or notes out of it. And that's how they started. We had military training in the orphanage. And, Star Spangled Banner. We was taught that. That was our national anthem. And you're supposed to stand up. And salute. And I was taught to play that tune. With every spark I had in my soul. On our lands we was taught. And when we play it. That's the feeling I have. And then they hoist that flag. Note for note, I still remember. Do you have a happy feeling when you play that song? I feel that I'm somebody. Yeah. When I finish playing Star Spangled Banner, I feel just as proud as anybody that that ever picked up a gun, shouldered a rifle, and said, Forward March. I was with James Baldwin, listening to Lewis, and he played a great set. And then he ended with the Star Spangled Banner. And James turned to me, and he said, You know, that's the first time I've liked that song. What he heard from Lewis did away with all the stuff that was accumulated around it. And just in the purity that Lewis brought to it made him appreciate it. Everybody talks about Hendrix and the Star Spangled Banner. But Armstrong was performing it as early as World War II. You know, right after Pearl Harbor. He started putting it in his repertoire. And he is going on stage and pouring his soul into that song. And there's pride. But there's also a tremendous amount of hurt every time you hear him play it. Louis Armstrong was coming from a 40-year memory of what slavery was. He understood that there was a battle in this country. So he was trying to use his music to transform and reform and lead the country closer to its higher ideals. Who, if anybody, was the biggest influence on your early life? What, in music? In music. King Oliver. Cause I outside of the waif's home. The orphanage. When I got out, he took me over. And he always told me, never play a lot. Of that jujitsu music. Play the lead. You got a good tone. And you know how to phrase. And it says something. And I carried his cornet. When he wasn't blowing and marching. And the police would have been. Running me out the parade. You know, I stayed with him on it. But that's my man. You play in that hot sun. You know, with that uniform on. 
and he put a hanky on his neck to keep the sun off his neck and he was really blowing that horn when the authorities closed down sinful old storyville more than 200 musicians suddenly found themselves out of work king oliver had left town anyhow for chicago where they had heard that their kind of music called jazz up north was getting very popular i have always been crazy over joe oliver and his playing so when joe sent for me to join him in chicago i was happy because i knew i'd feel at home and he'd see after me chicago was about the second most popular section for black people in the country it was a great migration point where people went off from alabama mississippi arkansas you could walk to chicago just keep walking if you had enough muscles in your legs i'd have gone back home if i knew i'd be pushed out into all them tall buildings finally i went to the lincoln garden and ah played that music i was so happy i did not know what to do i had hit the big time i was up north with the greats i was playing with my idol the king all of my boyhood dreams had come true at last all along i'd been hearing from all the musicians about little lewis and what a good trumpet player he was gonna be so when he brought little lewis over to dreamland to meet me little lewis was 226 pounds so i said little lewis how come you call him little lewis as big as he is i wasn't impressed at all i was very disappointed i probably would have never paid any attention to lewis's playing if king oliver hadn't said to me one night that lewis could play better than he could he says but as long as i keep him with me he won't be able to get ahead of me i'll still be the king after he told me that i started listening but when we got this recording date in richmond indiana for jeanette in trying to get the balance joe and lewis stood right next to each other as they always had and you couldn't hear a note that joe was playing and only could hear lewis so he said well i gotta do something so they put lewis about 15 feet away over in the corner from the band and ah uh, lewis was sitting in the co standing in the corner looking so sad you know he thought it was bad for him to have to be separated from the band and so i, I looked at him and smiled to reassure him that he was all right you know and then i said to myself now if ah uh, they have to put him that far away in order to hear joe he's gotta be better then i was convinced then lewis and i started getting to be sweethearts then we decided to get married i told him i said now i don't want to be married to a second trumpet player he says, what are you talking about? I said, well, I don't want to be married to second trumpet. I want you to play first. He said, well, I can't play first. Joe's playing first. I said, well, that's why you gotta quit. He said, I can't quit Mr. Joe. Mr. Joe sent for me. And I can't quit him. I said, well, it's Mr. Joe or me. I listened very carefully when Lil told me to always play the lead. He played 30 or 50 high notes, high C's. On this one tune they were playing. And the next day, everybody on the street was talking about it. People would come to two or three shows, waiting for him to miss it one day. So, he said to me, do you know people are coming to the show four or five times? To hear me miss that F? I said, yeah? Well, make some G's at home. So, he started blowing around the house. I said, oh, my God. 
Why did I say that? He never misses hitting. That high note, does he, folks? Armstrong extends the range of the horn. Ending every show. With hundreds of high C's. Just from that, more and more musicians. Start playing higher notes. He really perfects the art. Of improvisation. He shows the world what it could be. Tommy Rockwell had heard him. So it was he who suggested. That he form an, a, uh, recording outfit. And as a result, it was called. Uh, Louis Armstrong's Hot Five. Oh, do that thing, Papa Dip. You didn't work in clubs with the. No, we never did. Uh, think about nothing like that. Uh, we just, uh, make up them things. And, uh, scat. Yeah. Wait. Make up them things. What do you mean? Make up those tunes. Just in the studio? Yeah, sure. Say, don't you know it? There's a rumor that you invented scat. Is that true? Well, they claim. When we was recording, heebie-jeebies. We get down to this part for the second chorus. And I drop the paper. President in the control booth, he says. Keep on singing. See? Yeah. Well, that, uh, brought back memories. Of when I was a kid. Going around in the quartet. You know, Rampart Street in New Orleans. Whenever we'd get to a part. We didn't know the words. We'd go to scatting. And blowing like a trumpet. Or something like that. M-M-H-M-M. And it came to me just like that. When he's scatting. The notes he's picking. And how sophisticated. The melodies he's creating. Louis Armstrong is never out of tune. He could do with his voice. What he could do with his horn. When people sang in those days. They often sang. In a very corny manner like. And I love you. And you and me. And the baby makes three. Dinah. Is there anyone finer? In the state of Carolina? If there is and you know her. Know her. But Armstrong came in. With another kind of thing. Where he had that kind of. You know. Oh, Dinah. Is there anyone finer? In the state of Carolina? If there is and you know. Show me. Dinah. With her Dixie eyes blazing. How I love to sit and gaze. Into the eyes of Dinah Lee. Babe, every night. When I shake with fright, oh. Cause my Dinah might. Change her mind. Armstrong completely changes. The way people sing. I'm talking soul singing. I'm talking Ray Charles. I'm talking Sam Cooke. I'm talking James Brown. I'm talking hip hop. I'm talking funk. I'm talking pop music. I'm talking rock and roll. I'm talking the Beatles. Anybody who has basically uttered a sound. On American pop radio. In the last 90 years. It's because. Of Louis Armstrong's innovations. I met Louis on records. That West End Blues. Was a very, very moving experience. And it actually made a jazz fan out of me. And ultimately found the direction. For my whole career. As it did for so many people. West End Blues. Was a miniature masterpiece. I would say that. Jazz almost stems from Louis Armstrong. People are accustomed to saying. And I've heard it said a lot. That he was a genius. Uh, but very few people talk about. Why he was a genius. And what it was. That his particular form of genius did. I could say now. That what he was really doing. Was playing music. For which there was no accounting. In his immediate environment. Louis Armstrong is. The first important soloist. Because he is the first to break away. From Western harmony. And to reintroduce the melodic. And rhythmic developments. Of of African music. Stop it. Stop it. You are playing notes. Between flat and natural. It's like discovering, ah, uh, a secret scale. 
just made for this type of music. The so-called jazz scale is used only melodically. That is, in the tune. In the harmony underneath. We still use our old unflatted notes against the flatted note in the tune. So that causes a dissonance to happen. Jazz pianists are always using this dissonance. I'm sure it sounds familiar to you. And there's a reason for it. It's because they are looking for a note that isn't actually there, but which lies somewhere between the two. This is called a quarter tone. The quarter tone comes to us from Africa, which is, after all, the cradle of jazz. And where quarter tones are everyday stuff. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we gonna take a little trip through the jungles this time. And we want y'all to travel with us. That tiger's running so fast. Gonna take a few choruses to catch him. So I want y'all to count with me. Yes, sir. Because this Sanofa trumpet is gonna get away from you this time. Lay it out there, boys. I'm ready. At this time in his career, Lewis was having problems with managers. And, inevitably, the gangsters took a hand in his affairs. There were certain interests in New York. Who thought the trumpet king belonged there? The gangster. Which was the toughest man in, ah. Uh, in Chicago at that time, Frankie Foster. He said, you know. You're going to New York tomorrow? I told him. I didn't know nothing about that. Nobody told me nothing about it. I said, excuse me a minute. I'm going back on the stand. He said. You're going to New York tomorrow. That's when he pulled that. 45. Hmm. I said. Well, maybe I am going to New York. The whole business end. Of music at that time. Was controlled by white people. They were not all crooks. They were not all. Manipulating black people. But, uh, quite a few of them were. It was very difficult for a black musician. Not to be very bitter about the entire system at that time. But Lewis was one of those few rare people that never gave the impression of being bitter, whether it was under the surface or not. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mr. Armstrong, and we're gonna swing one of the good old good ones for you. Beautiful number. I cover the waterfront. I cover the waterfront, I like it. 1, 2. In 1932, first time I went to Europe. We used to travel by boats. Johnny Collins was my manager then. Didn't they give you the name of Satchmo over here? Yeah. Given by, uh, Fuzzy Brooks. Uh, he was the editor of the Melody Maker at that time. When I arrived in Plymouth, England, on the ship. And then somebody's going up there. Hello, Satchmo. When I went all through Europe. And everything with different cats. You know, trying to be managing things. I said, these are the people. I don't want to be bothered with. They're doing everything. But protecting their trumpet. See, I had a manager who would. Who would grab all the money. Out the box office. You know, that frantic stuff, you know. I say, well, that ain't what I want to do. Around about that time. That Louis Armstrong found out. That his managing director, Mr. Collins. Was making, uh, 20,000 pounds a week for him. And Louis was getting about. Say, about 100 pounds a week. And he asked for more money. And Mr. Collins, ah. Uh, he used some beautiful adjectives. I said, listen, cocksucker. You might be my manager. And you might be the biggest shit. And, and book me. In the biggest places in the world. But when I get out on that fucking stage. With that horn and get in trouble. You can't save me. He said, take that nigger off the boat. Got to brawling, goddammit. Shit. They gonna have this shit under control. And there's a big bottle of wine. 
All I had to do was take it like that. And the bald-headed motherfucker had his head down and said, I gotta just tap it like a pansy and kill the motherfucker. See, but the first thing I thought, all of them black cocksuckers in Harlem, who'd say, I knew he would blow his top someday. I don't know why. Fuck it. I got this shit. Go on and eat your meal, man. Not that I hadn't been called a nigger before. He fired Collins. He got rid of him. But Collins had a contract on him. So, Lewis remembered that he had worked for Joe Glazer. And that Joe Glazer was tied in with some pretty rough boys around Chicago. So Lewis got in touch with Joe. And he told Joe, he said, I'm having a lot of trouble with this guy managing me. He said, I'm kind of scared. He said, I don't know what he's gonna try to do to me. He says, um, but I want you for my manager. The toughest guy in the honky tonk that runs the gambling. He knew I was getting ready to come up north. And, uh, this is the pep talk he gave me. He said, look here, son. I like the way you blow that quail. Talking about my cornet. I knew what he was talking about. I said, yeah. He said, now, you go up north. And always have a white man behind you. To say, that's my nigger. And that's the way he put it to me. Now, you can figure that out yourself. That was the talk. And Joe Glazer came right in the scene. What did the? We were just like that. Because he knew I wanted to blow my horn. And he saw to that. I said, this is my man. I said. You tend to business, Daddy Glazer. And I'll blow the horn. And that's where it is. And it's it's been. Over twenty some years. And, ah. Uh, we ain't even signed a contract. Joe Glazer's a nigga. Joe Glazer loves Negroes. He was raised with niggas. He went to school with them. That's right. That's right. You know, I always felt. There was a weird relationship. Between Joe Glazer and Lewis. And I felt Lewis was exploited. Lewis believes that he never would have. Made it without Joe Glazer. I think he wouldn't have. That's possible? Quite possible. You got to have good management. I don't care how great you are. Good management goes. Hand in hand with success and talent. He never wanted anything. To do with business, right? He never even hired the guys in his band. He just wanted to concentrate. On that horn. Glazer. On the strength of being with Lewis. Lewis used to tell us stories. About they used to ride the bus. Down south with Glazer. And Glazer didn't none of them. Hardly had enough to eat with. But on the strength of that. Lewis started getting real popular. Glazer started getting good PR for Lewis. By 1935, there were probably. Some who hadn't heard of Lewis Armstrong. And perhaps even those few. Were erased that year. When he recorded, La Cucaracha. Red sails in the sunset. On Treasure Island. In the summer of 1936. He said to me, we're going on a tour. Of one night stands. Why don't you ride along in the bus? So you can see what it's like? It was a very exhausting trip. For musicians in those days. There were no air-conditioned buses. At that time. Now, we've traveled 800 miles. You know, you get up. You can't hardly stand up. You'd think he would take it easy. The first few sets are something like that. No, you'd get in there. And that first number, boy. Pow, pow, pow. There was no let up. He was there to entertain the people. And believe me. That's what he believed in. No other leader I know would have. Put up with what he had to go through. Lewis became attached to laxatives. When you traveled. On the band bus with him. And you didn't know too much. About laxatives. 
he would find a way for you. Two, ah, uh, imbibe some of it. When I first got to know him, it was Pluto water. But then come Swiss Chris, which he really got to like. Enjoy the fun of eager living. That radiant, refreshed feeling. That comes from everyday regularity. Don't think for once that Swiss Chris wasn't in the rudimentals of my life. But I always did believe in herbs. My mother always believed in herbs. Herbs. How do you say it? Herbs. Herbs. No, I, I say I say, hoibs. Well. Okay. Well, I'll say, herbs. Herbs. You know what I'm talking about. Herbs. Right. They make you trot. Pardon? Anyway. Have some. And just leave it all behind you, daddy. He believed that the laxatives were of primary, uh, significance to your health. His doctor traveled with him. Dr. Schiff told us, don't try to emulate this guy at home because you'd die, probably tomorrow. Lewis was perhaps the strongest guy I ever worked around because he he didn't try to live carefully or anything like this. He lived the way he wanted to live and to heck with it. That's how he lived, you know. At 5 o'clock in the morning, Louis Armstrong had to be rushed to the hospital. Louis had a case history of of a bad heart for a long time. We did a thing over in Spoleto, Italy. And, um, he had a pretty bad heart attack over there in, uh, Spoleto, Italy. They sent to Rome to get this, uh, special nurse in. She was here fast. Oh, yeah. She was good looking too. Well, I ain't went with that. I'm trying to get well now. When she said, ooh uh, Sachmo, eh? She come with this thermometer, you know? Ooh uh. I said, what you gonna do with that? She said. And this thermometer. I said, okay. Ah. Ah, what? Like, ah, y'all trying to kill me. Now here is one of the miracles of show business. Because when Louis Armstrong was with us in Spoleto, Italy, certainly Bob Precht and I never thought to see him alive again. Because, as you know, he was desperately sick over there. On the verge of dying, recovered. And is now back playing his horn. Nah, I ain't gonna give nobody. None of my jelly roll give you none of it to save your soul ain't gonna give nobody none of my jelly roll jelly roll you see the other day i met a man from uh zanzibar who was telling me quite a lot about racial prejudice where in uh east africa what africa you get it all over the world right here you get prejudice are you kidding they were all over the world not only in africa many places right here you get prejudice here yeah everywhere how is it here well essence of it all over have you any uh examples of it here well you can see a whole lot of example i can go out there right now within an hour's time and see five situations where there's, uh, race prejudice. The discrimination was unbelievable. I think you had to be part of it. Or to be very close to it. To get any idea of what it was like. To be black in those days. It seemed, on the surface. That, uh, a lot of black musicians. And black people were accepting it. Or were trying to live with it. As best they could. But the resentment, you know understandably, was tremendous. And the conditions for living. I mean, just for finding a place. To stay overnight, you know. Uh, finding a place. To go get something to eat. Everything presented its difficulties. Because everything was segregated. And I'm talking about even in New York. But it was tragic, what you had. To go with this discrimination. 
and you had to be tough. Cause discrimination. In a sneaky sort of way. Killed a whole lot of musicians. Because they couldn't understand the code. Do you know I played 99 million? Hotels I couldn't stay at? When I was coming along. A black man had hell. On the road, he couldn't find. No place to eat, sleep, or use the toilet. Service station cats see a bus. Of colored bandsmen drive up. And they would sprint to lock. Their restroom doors. One time in Dallas, Texas. Some ofe stops me as I enter. This hotel where I'm blowing the show. Me in a goddamn tuxedo, now. And tells me I gotta come around. To the back door. In Memphis, at the bus station. They claimed that the bus. Needed some work done on it. And they were gonna take it back. To have it overhauled. At that particular time. All the guys in Lewis's band were young. And just about as obstinate. A bunch of people. As you ever met in your life. If they thought they were right. When nobody would give up the bus. Then they sent for the police. And arrested us for inciting a riot. With the intention of burning up. All of our baggage and everything. Luggage and everything. And putting us in the Huskow. Which they did. They arrested us all. He was playing in Los Angeles. One time. I don't remember where. And I, along with some other friends. Drove out to hear him play. And, uh, we got to this place. We were put given a table. And Lewis saw me. He was in the middle of a radio broadcast. And, uh, then the broadcast was over. And he disappeared in back. And I waited. I thought he'd come over and have a drink. Or a Coca-Cola or a cup of coffee. Or something. And he never showed up. I waited about 10 minutes. And finally, I thought. Well, what's wrong? I went backstage. He was back there. With his little typewriter. He was always writing. These marvelous letters he wrote. And I said, hi, pops. He said, hey, Artie. How you been? I said, I thought. I understood you to indicate. That you'd come over to the table. He looked at me. He said. Man, I can't come to your table. And I said, why? He said, oh, they don't allow me to sit. Well, I can't sit. At the tables out there. Well, I looked at him. In total astonishment. My first reaction was, well, why the hell? Are you playing these places? My next reaction was the practical one of. You play where you gotta play. And, uh, Lewis was not in. A what we now call civil rights fight. Lewis was in AA. In an individual, uh, fight to survive. I guess his own inner dignity. Was able to make him prevail. Over all these awful conditions. He must have worked with. As time went on and I made a reputation. I had to put it in my contracts. That I would not play no place. I couldn't stay at. I was the first negro in the business. To crack them big, white hotels. Oh, yeah. I pioneered, pops. People got tired of that situation. You know, that, uh. The separate this and the separate that. If a man is able and capable enough. And could put the the things together. What a leader wants, he's. And he wants to hire him, he'd hire him. Old rockin' chairs got me. Old rockin' chair got you, father. What a marvelous. Democratic thing music is. That's right. We went everywhere together. And, uh. We never had a hard word or nothing. We didn't worry about, you know, color. Gin, son. You know you don't drink gin, father. I mean, in the early days, we did this. When those things wasn't happening. Jack and I was. Busting those down barriers. Hitting the south there. And just going all over. Some guy asked me. He said. Man, you're gonna take Jack Teagarden? 
I said, now, who am I to tell a white man? He can't go down south? And it's all through New Orleans, Texas. I guess, more than all of the laws. Music has had more to do with better. Race relations through the years. Hasn't it, Pops? It's done a lot. You remember that white boy. He's a sailor or something. Uh, on one of these battleships. AAT Pearl Harbor? And he caught my show. And come to find out. He has damn near every record I made. From 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 childhood. Even his parents. But still and all, he expressed himself. He come up, and he shook my hand. After the whole show was over, didn't he? And he said. You know, I don't like Negroes. Right to my fucking face. That motherfucker told me. And so I said. Well, I admire your goddamn sincerity. He said, I don't like Negroes. But you one son of a bitch. I'm crazy about, baby. Didn't he? There, now. You take the majority of white people. There's, uh, two-thirds of them. Don't like niggers. But they always got one nigger. That they just crazy about, goddamn it. Ain't that a bitch? Pops, he faced a lot of challenges. And he always faced them with style. And maintained his sanity and his joy. And his embrace of life. And it was not a simple-minded happiness. It was a transcendent joy. He had a blessing inside of him. That he was acutely aware of. I remember when I was. A neighbor of Louis Armstrong. We lived within one block of one another. In Corona, Queens, New York, for 15 years. I went over to his house. To wish him a happy birthday. And to bring him a little present. And I wound up getting a present myself. And also a present for my wife, Lorraine. If you had a hard luck story. And you needed something. And you came to Lewis, you got it. This is a throwback. It's been instilled in him. In the old days of in New Orleans. When Lewis was a youth coming up. It was a way of life down there. They were all poor. And the one that had a little more. Than the other. Saw to it that the one that has less. Had a little bit. So he never outgrew it. He liked to get to know the people. That's where it was at with Lewis. And I think everyone knows that. You can see Lewis. See that, uh, in all the years. And with all of the success. That Lewis has had. Lewis still remained the man. In the street himself. Royal Theater. Was in a poor Negro neighborhood. Real poor people, I'm telling you. Until we arrived in town. It was actually colder. I'm telling you, it was colder than. A well digger's well, you know the rest. And when I heard about those poor people. Who couldn't afford to buy hard coal. I bought it for them. I went to the coal yard. Ordered a ton of coal. And had the company to deliver it. To the lobby of the Royal Theater. And had all the folks who needed coal. To help themselves. Which made them very happy. Of course, it all made me. Stick out my chest with pride. To be in his presence. To see the power that he had. See, you'd go in his dressing room. He'd be sitting up, in his underwear. With a towel around his lap. And one around his shoulders. And had a white handkerchief on his head. And he put that grease around his lips. Looked like a minstrel man. You know, with the white. And laughing. Natural, see, the way he is. And in the room. You'll see maybe two nuns, a streetwalker. You see maybe a guy. That's come out of penitentiary. You see a rabbi. You see a priest. All of the all of the different levels. Of society in a dressing room. And he's talking to all of them. I'd like you to meet my son. First time we see important looking whites. Be so, like, ah, uh, putty in the presence. Of a figure. Who had opened up the world of music. To new heights, you know? Now you know I don't lie much. Fellas she can't get. The fellas she ain't met. 
Lewis. You had, obviously, a very eventful life. Ever since I've known you. They've been making a film on you. They make. A whole lot of films now. You know? Well, now I hear. They're finally gonna do a film on you. Yeah. Glad they can't come up to me and say. You must be a movie star. I can tell by the film on your teeth. Hollywood fascinates me. Everywhere I go. There's a warm greeting for me. But you still have some small-minded. Prop men, carpenters, callboys. One of the moments that dragged me. The most happened in 1952. During the making of Glory Alley. Glory Alley, Glory Alley. Hear that trumpet moan in Glory Alley. And this Ofe. He wasn't nothing but a callboy. He called, uh, the extras. Uh the extras and different things. Then he'll come. To the star's dressing room. Let them know when they want. Them for the camera. And he was hanging around. On the set all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So now, he'll come up. Mr. Gilbert Rowland, Ms. Karen. And everything. And then he'll come to my dressing room. With a whole lot of bullshit. Satchmo, you better come on out there. Or they'll, uh, uh. They'll send in Harry James. I said, listen, you cocksucker. If they wanted Harry James. They'd have had him in front. I said, the first place, he ain't. Gonna play what I played out there. He said, why? I said, cause he can't. Just had to be a nasty. Son of a bitch with him. And I said, you take it you tell MGM. To shove that picture up their ass. Then he left me alone. I said, I don't. I ain't a movie star no how. I said, why you hand me that shit? Cause I'm colored? I didn't appreciate it. I'm just showing. You what I go through for no reason. You take the smallest fucking peckerwood. Hand you that shit. And the big bosses appreciate you. He made as many as 30 films. The Glenn Miller story, the way he's cast. In that is very positive. Yes, Basin Street is the street. Where the folks really meet. Who is he? Who? Louis Armstrong. A song was born. What Lewis does there is just performing. They took a reet jungle beat. Brought it to Basin Street. And that's how jazz was born. In high society, he is Louis Armstrong. Hello, Dolly. Of course, it's the last one. Well, hello, Dolly. Look who's here. This is Louis, Dolly. Hello, Louis. It's so nice to have you back. Where you belong. They didn't write a whole lot of parts. You know, character parts. They just let me be myself in pictures. That's what made it awful nice. We all can't be, uh, Reinhardt's. And things like that. So they just tell me, be yourself. All my days were happiness. Cause I'm born with nothing. Come here with nothing. And I come through the world. Whatever nothing I had. I enjoyed playing the music. And what little, uh, advancement. Or whatever it was. It was more than I had at all times. And right now, it's still more than I had. And the fans are still happy with Satchmo. And I wouldn't give a damn. If they had ten trillion dollars. They can't be no happier than. Louis, Satchmo, Armstrong and Lucille. We never want an estate where servants be falling all over each other. They're working for colored people. And then we don't want to go through that. And I want to live the life that I come through with what Mayan, my mother, taught me. Enjoy the rudimentals. To hell with the rest of it. I'm confessing that I love you. Tell me, do you love me too? I'm confessing that I need you. Honest, I do. Oh, baby, need you every moment. Oh, yeah? Lucille, how did he propose? I mean. What did he say to you? Well, actually. How long did you know him? 
Uh, about two years. Two years? Oh, yes. Well, it wasn't love at first sight then. Was it, Louis? Mm, plenty love going on then. But not at first sight. I see. Well, you know, I'm Louis's fourth wife. Oh, I see. Ua. And, uh, he was separated. From his third wife. And so the we couldn't marry. And he kept saying. Well, you just stick around. You know, wait for pops. Mm. And, uh, I'll get a divorce. You know. And he's taking care of. This woman's getting alimony. She's not about to give him up. Yeah. And I just laughed. He just tells me. Now, you just stay put, you know. And one of these days, um, all. She'll give me a divorce. And we'll marry. Yeah. And I'm young. But how long do you wait? So I was seen on the scene. With the young boys. And Lewis got tired of that. And he says, look, I can't hold you down. I guess I better marry you. You right. I'll get the divorce. Am I guessing that you love me, babe? Oh, yeah. Dreaming dreams of you in vain, vain. I'm confessing that I love you. Chops. Over again. Well, what has been, ah? Uh, to you, the most encouraging things? My fourth wife, she fixed a nice home. Not elaborate, just s someplace. Where you settle down. Ah, uh, your castle. It's such a pleasure to go home. That's why I cancelled the road tour. 3456 107th Street. 107th? Yeah. Street. Corona, New York. The Queens. It should be Long Island. But, ah, uh, New York for many. We would stay at my apartment. But my mother had to get out. Of her bedroom and sleep in my small room. So Louis. And I could have the large bedroom. For the few days of that we went home. So I decided to buy a house. And I told Louis, let's get a house. And he said. What do you want a house for? We'll be traveling. I I'll get a hotel room. And I wasn't about to be cooped up. In a hotel room. And after being married to Louis. For a few months. I found that it wasn't very easy. To argue with Louis. If he made his mind up about something. He was very, very positive. That you couldn't change his mind. And so he kept not wanting this house. And I'm a very stubborn person myself. And so I said, this guy doesn't know. What the house is all about. I bought the house myself. And didn't tell him. I had had the house eight months. Before I told Louis. Eight whole months. Meanwhile, my mother's writing me. About what's happening. And they're planting flowers. And this, that and the other. So finally, I tell him, two weeks before. We were to go back to New York. And I told him, I said. Pops, I got something to tell you. So he said. Well, what have you done now? I said, I haven't done anything. I don't think you're going to be unhappy. About what I've done. But, uh, I wanna. Uh, I have to tell you that we've moved. And he said, we've what? He said, we've moved? He said, that's all right. You got a larger apartment. I said, no, I bought a house. So he looked at me like I was, you know. Like I was a cow with seven horns. Now he said, how did you pay for it? You didn't ask me for any money. I said, you have to remember. I have been working for 13 years. I have a little money saved up. And so, when I approached you. 
about a house and you were so down on it. I didn't ask you. I just took my money. And I put the down payment on the house. And I've been keeping the payments up. I said. Now that you know about the house. You can take the payments over. But I've never been able to move Lewis. From that place. Once he got in that place, he loved it. Mrs. Armstrong, do you? Always go with Lewis wherever he goes? Yes, I do. It's your job to look after him? That's part of my marital vow. To take care of the husband. Yes. And, uh, while I, uh we travel a lot. We try to maintain a home life. Wherever we go. So we were constantly together. There was. There wasn't that that, uh, separation. As most musicians and wives have. But then, I was fortunate. For the simple reason. That Lewis wanted me with him. And secondly. He could afford to keep me with him. And the other chaps. Couldn't afford to take their families. Did it get boring at any time? Listening to Lewis night after night? You gotta be kidding. Really? How could anyone be bored? With those beautiful notes? Yeah, I had an audience with the Pope. You had an audience with the Pope? And I remember that morning. There was 10,000 people there waiting. Just to see him. And my wife. She's dressed for the occasion. Had on an outfit with a black veil. And an I'm sharp. So he asked me, have you any children? I said. Well, no, daddy. But we still wailing. And, ah. Uh, now, let's talk about pot. Yeah. I'm only sorry. You couldn't be here with us longer. I wish you could have gotten higher. But why don't you go and say hello? To the folks on the panel? Well, I'm getting higher next time round. Mary, Wuna. Honey, you sure was good. And I enjoyed you very much. Marijuana is more of a medicine than dope. Why did he do it? Well, because it relaxes you. It does something to your hearing. And if you're a musician. It does something to your playing. I have to go through. The whole world with this horn. Making millions happy. And at the same time. Ducking and dodging cops, dicks, so forth. Why? Cause they say it's against the law. I'm not so particular about. Having a permit to carry a gun. All I want is a permit. To carry that good shit. On the West Coast, California, in 1931. When I got busted. It was during our intermission. Two big, healthy dicks. Detectives, that is. Come from behind a car, man. And say to us. We'll take the roach, boys. I spent nine days in. The downtown Los Angeles City Jail. And when all of those prisoners looked up. And saw me walk in. With this great big deputy sheriff. They all en masse started. Hey, Louis Armstrong. The judge gave me a suspended sentence. And I went to work that night. Wailed just like nothing happened. Ladies and gentlemen. Louis Armstrong has told me. That his most honored ambition. Is being fulfilled tonight. In playing with the New York Philharmonic. I should say that it is rather we. On the longer haired side of the fence. Who are honored in that. When we play the St. Louis Blues. We are only doing a blown up imitation. Of what he does. And what he does is real and true. And honest and simple and even noble. I never shall forget. The first time we went to Africa in 1956. My God, darling. I had no idea. I would be so thrillingly received. By my brothers and sisters. In my homeland, Africa. This is, though, a tour. To make friends and influence people. Well, I guess that's the idea. When they did it. But all we want to get out there. And blow for them cats. They're all fans. Yeah, we got off the plane and. All for you. Lord, for you, Lewis. 
la la la. The attendance was so fantastic that there wasn't a place to hold it except the polo grounds, which was just a big stadium. And then one of the chiefs said to Lewis, hello, Sachmo. And Lewis told me, he said, see that, moms? They even got my records in the bush. You know, everybody knows pops. I had a wonderful time. I take it you did. Yeah. They had about nine tribes down there. That's that come from miles away. Just to dance with us. And in one of those tribes. They had a chick swinging there. Look just my mother. Man, I made the cameraman. Call her over here. And let her put a couple of. Wiggle waggle woos on there for me. Here's a song we did. That was all about. One of the big events of the year. In my hometown. The Zulu parade in Mardi Gras week. But it wasn't until 1949. 23 years after I made this record. That they elected Sachmo. To be the king of the Zulus. I got to New Orleans. And it was like everybody was crazy. In that city. Everybody was packing the streets. And there were all kinds. Of racial paradoxes. Like the Zulus were. Prepared to present Lewis that night. In a concert. At Booker T. Washington Auditorium. Armstrong's All-Star Band. Has played 45 minutes. Of New Orleans's own Dixieland music. To an enthusiastic capacity crowd. I went to the concert, and I saw. Black spectators seated on the left. And the center aisles. While the whites were. Over on the right aisle. But on the stage. I saw Lewis and Jack Teagarden. With their arms around each other. Re-radiating interracial brotherhood. Singing a duet. And I saw white officials. Shaking hands with Lewis on stage. And congratulating him. And paying tribute to his talent. I saw Lewis bursting with pride. When the mayor of New Orleans. Gave him the keys to the city. That was the week. He made the cover of Time. It was on every white newsstand in town. On behalf of the people of New Orleans. The city with a colorful past. And a promising future. We want to present you. The key to the city. Ah. To Louis Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mayor. This is really a treat. This is the thrill of my life. But I also knew. That there were hundreds of places. To which those keys would never admit him. When he was king. Everybody was getting out. People that didn't get out on carnival. They going out to see Louis Armstrong. King of the Zulu. And there was so many people. Everything got held up. You know what I mean? It was stopping everything. And he just had to get off the float. You know. Cause sooner or later, man. He might have got hurt up there. You understand me? Rex was the biggest parade. Of all the white parades. And by white, I mean it was what it was. It was segregated. But Zulu was like. The height of everything. So, for Pops, he wanted. To be the king of Zulu his entire life. The king of Zulu. Would dress up in blackface. That's what he did. So Louis Armstrong did it. And it became, you know, a crime. That was a great thing then. Yeah. Cuz what's going on now? With all these marches and organizations. They won't let it happen no more now. You know, all that makeup. First thing about blackface is. We have to understand. That it comes out of minstrelsy. Minstrelsy was not invented. To elevate Negroes. Minstrelsy was invented to get jobs. For white guys who were imitating Negroes. Now, what it became, ironically. Was the first mass popular phenomenon. In American culture. You have to know what the tradition is. So it's people everywhere. Who don't know what that tradition is. All they're seeing is. A blackface minstrel. But he wasn't looking at it like that. 
You had a lot of traditions and things that you had that were were viable and good and meaningful. And then, during the movement, we threw all of that stuff out. Dancing a certain way, cheesing, tomming. And, uh, we didn't want to be a part of any of that. And after the funeral, with just Sonny and me, alone in the empty kitchen, I tried to find out something about him. What do you want to do? I want to play jazz, he said. You mean like Louis Armstrong? His face closed as though I'd struck him. No, I'm not talking about none of that old time, down home crap. Pops, how much do you think you've lost out of not your own life and certainly not your own pride, but out of commercial life by being born black in a white country? No, I don't look at it that way. Your color don't mean shit to me. If you're a dumb son of a bitch, you understand? MMHMM. Right, so, are you a man or mouse? It's up to you. A lot of young people resented the way they thought Armstrong was too submissive to the United States. If you coming up in the 50s and 60s, there's a different aesthetic, a different kind of attitude, political attitude, in the street. And they didn't understand Lewis. Because Lewis was always affable. Always smiling. Yay. Keeps that Georgia on my mind. Yeah. Hmm. They don't realize. That Lewis was doing that. When he was around his friends. He was acting the same way. That's right. But when you do it in front of white folks. And try to make them enjoy what you feel. That's what he was doing. Right. They call him Uncle Tom. Yes. Oh, you can bend her legs. Bend her arms and bathe her too. Let's fly down or drive down. To New Orleans. First time you misplace words. And do that shit. They gonna say you Uncle Tomming. And goddamn it. And every fucking nationality comedian. Stays right in this category. Look at the Jew. Doesn't he use his dialect? I ain't supposed to be no comedian. That's just everyday life, you know. Suppose, my ass. You are a natural comedian. Yeah, well, that's all right. A lot of his film roles. The early ones, I never liked those. For my generation to see him. Singing to horses and stuff. Or the kind of way black people. Acted in films. It's not just Louis Armstrong. Gosh all, get up. How'd they get so lit up? Gosh all, get up. How'd they get that size? Archie got his nose broke. For fighting a nigga. Cuz he didn't like. The way he talked about me. This smug motherfucker said. Louis Armstrong. Uncle Tom nigga. When the fuck have I, Uncle Tomed? In my life? I tell ya. All you have to do is. Break up your face and mug. And a nigga say your Uncle Tom. I'm blowing this horn. A man got expressions. Most of the fellas. I grew up with, myself included. We used to laugh at Louis Armstrong. We knew he could play the horn. But that didn't save him. From our malice and our ridicule. Everywhere we'd look. There would be old Lewis. Sweat popping, eyes bugging. Mouth wide open, grinning. Oh, my lord, from ear to ear. Oofta, we called it. Mopping his brow, ducking his head. Doing his thing for the white man. Oh, yeah. It wasn't until 1966. When we were working together. On a picture in New York. With Sammy Davis Jr. Cicely Tyson. That I got to know Lewis better. One day, we'd broken for lunch. And I decided to stay inside. It was quiet. So I thought everybody had gone. I went back on the set. To lie down on the bed. And there was Lewis by the door. Sitting in a chair. Staring up and out into space. With the saddest. Most heartbreaking expression. 
I've ever seen on a man's face. I just stared at him for a moment. And then when I tried to turn and sneak away, the noise snapped Lewis out of it. And all of a sudden, there was that professional grin again. Mouth wide open. He whipped out his handkerchief. Mopped his brow. Hey, pops. Look like you cats trying to starve old Lewis to death, yeah. I put on my face and grinned right back. But it wasn't funny. Not anymore. What I saw in that look shook me. It was my father. My uncle. Myself, down through the generations. Doing exactly what Lewis had had to do. For the same reason. To survive. I never laughed at Lewis after that. For beneath that gravel voice. And that shuffle. Under all that mouth with more teeth. Than a piano had keys. Was a horn that could kill a man. That horn is where Lewis had. Kept his manhood hid all those years. Enough for him, enough for all of us. Sometimes I feel. Like a motherless child, playing. I understand. You're somewhat of a politician. Do you know anything about politics? No. No. Uh, politics, uh. I don't think you could print that. That are African golfers. And stuff like that. We confuse what we perceived. As the social demeanor. In that context of lynching. You understand? Overt segregation. And we thought. That Lewis was submitting to that. Sometimes I feel. Like a motherless child. You know, Lewis's expression. Was musical and artistic. And transcended that. When it was possible for Lewis to speak. He spoke. Lewis was very sensitive. When people did something that he felt. I guess the word would be, unethical. What about you? Do you. Think the colored students will show up? If I got anything to do with it. They won't show up. Well, I think it's a breaking point. Of the school integration. I don't feel that they should. Have a right to go to school. Oh, when the saints. When the saints. Go marching in. Go marching in. When the saints go marching in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I want to be in that number. Oh, yeah. When the saints come marching in. When the saints. Oh, when the saints. Go marching in. Are marching in. Who's gonna play on the day? That the saints go marching in? Well, man. The mostest and the greatest. From the oldest to the latest. Gonna play in the band. In the big bandstand. When the saints go marching in. Now, Lewis, how about Brahms? Oh, he ain't no bum. Little Rock, Arkansas. The white population are determined. To prevent colored students from going. To the school their own children attend. And Mozart composed. With all he had. With symphonies. And operas and all that jazz. Later, the Central High School. Of Little Rock Storm Center was sealed off. By orders of the governor. Who called out the State National Guard. Oh, when the saints. Go marching in. Oh, when the saints. Colored youngsters arrived. Under safe conduct by the guards. But no sooner had they arrived. Than they were off again. Arkansas had evidently decided. To make its own laws. On the subject of integration. Go marching in. What are you gonna tell the Russians? When they ask you. About the Little Rock incident? It all depends what time. They send me over there. I don't think they should send me unless. They straighten that mess down south. Two, four, six, eight. We don't want to integrate. They've been ignoring the Constitution. Al although they're taught it in school. But when they go home. Their parents tell them different. Say, you don't have to abide by it. Because we've been getting away with it. A hundred years. So, uh, nobody tells on each other. So don't bother with it. So, if they ask me what's happening, uh. If I go now, I can't tell a lie. 
that's one thing. There's no worth. Lying the way I feel about it. Thank you, Louis. Okay. Now I'll say this to you. I'll never open the public schools. In Little Rock. On an integrated basis. Until the people say so. You know. There's a certain type of naivete. That a country like this has. In those who are super patriotic. And they don't see anything. It's just, everything we do is great. And then those who are not patriotic. At all and see that we don't do anything. Louis Armstrong was not in either camp. And I dare say that he was actually more. In the forefront of civil rights. In terms of making statements. Than a lot of the so-called. Modern musicians of that time were. And even when he said what he said. About Eisenhower in the 50s. Yeah, he was upset about segregation. Well, he said that. As far as he was concerned. Ike and the government could go to hell. And he sang his version of. The Star Spangled Banner, to me. With very dirty, ah, uh, lyrics. Oh, say, can you mother's MFC. By the MF early light. He was very mad. Then he said a number of things. One of which was, as for Orville Faubus. He's just an ignorant plowboy. Well, I think it's a damn shame. For people. To be so deceitful and two-faced. I mean, that, uh that governor. I mean, I bet you right now. He's got an old colored mammy there. Nursing his baby. The nation alone, I mean. Is misguided, cold-blooded. Shame just to keep it up. They can't stand it. I mean, how can they rest well at night? Thinking they have to. Go through that tomorrow? The kids, ah, uh, they're only doing. What their parents told them. They wouldn't do it if. I mean, the colored people. Who, at the end of the day. They I don't know why, but, ah. Uh, when they throw their. We throw our heart in it and everything. Because we're just doing it. For our country. Everybody was astonished. When Lewis did it publicly. But privately he had expressed stuff. Like that all his life. You know, he was very conscious of. What we now call civil rights. He blew up. He put it on the line. You know, and, of course. He had very, 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 very bad comments. From our political leaders. About making this particular statement. That you know. They interviewed Adam Clayton Powell. They interviewed Sammy Davis. They put Pops down. Because they said he was a musician. He didn't know what he was talking about. Lewis was that kind of person. He either he said nothing. And when he got angry. He said what was in his heart. And his mind. It seems that. The White House was waiting for. Some big name to speak out. And Lewis made his statement today. And the troops were in Little Rock. The next morning. After he'd made the statement. He sent Eisenhower a wire saying that. If you will go in with the troops. I'll go with you. That's little known. You know, ah. Uh, oh, you know, it's a funny thing. Nobody really stopped to really dig pops. And it's an unfortunate thing. He felt it deeply. He really did. A prophet is without honor. In his own country. That's it. Hmm. Yes. Great. We're gonna do this once more. Lewis, and say. Set man free. Me too? We know. When they get through. Set man free. They say I look like God. In the image of God. Created he them. Could God be black? My God. The real ambassadors. It was meant to be a stage show. And, ah, uh, unfortunately. It never made it to Broadway. The tale of it was. That jazz represented America. In a very special way. And that jazz musicians. Were the real ambassadors. Not politicians or speechmakers. Can it be? Hallelujah. He brought the same thing. To every song he sang. 
understanding the human condition. Any kind of lyrics. He could just imbue with that. That understanding, it's like a. It's a spiritual thing. It's a depth and an insight. He's watching all the earth. The simple emotional impact of jazz has cut through all kinds of barriers. Louis Armstrong has become an extraordinary kind of roaming ambassador of goodwill. Well, you might say, he's America's ambassador with a horn. I'm the real ambassador. It is evident I was sent by government to take your place. All I do is play the blues. See, Jack, I think you're wrong about me being the ambassador. I think jazz is the ambassador. Well, I might be the courier. That takes the message over there. But it's jazz that does the talking. My horn and me have traveled. From Sweden to Spain. And when I played Berlin. A lot of them cats jumped the iron fence. To hear old Satchmo. Ah, which proves. That music is stronger than nations. I don't know much about politics. But I know these people. In foreign countries. Hear all kinds of things about America. Some good, some bad. I'm pretty sure. What comes out of this horn. Makes them feel better about us. One thing is sure, they know. A trumpet ain't no cannon. It ought to be possible. For American consumers of any color. To receive equal service. In places of public accommodation. Such as hotels and restaurants and theaters and retail stores without being forced to resort to demonstrations in the street when you return to the United States do you intend to take a more active part in civil rights they have uh other people politicians who take care of things like that and so the best i can do is uh put a little uh something in their till and that's my part that's the best I can do. Ah. Uh. Because, ah, uh, I love everybody. I mean, ah, uh, the white people. They're my greatest fans. All through the South. We stay in the best hotels. And they give us the best courtesies. And, ah, uh, my biggest audience is. People all over the United States. So I can't abuse either one. So I don't ignore the the. The march and the the whatever it is. I just do my little part. By putting a little money in my part. Which some of them don't do, but I do. You understand pops? That's right. Hmm. For me, if I'd be out somewhere. Marching with a sign. And some cat hits me in my chops. I'm finished. A trumpet man gets hit in the chops. And he's through. If my people don't dig me the way. That I am, I'm sorry. If they don't go along with me. Giving my dough instead of marching. Well, every cat's entitled to his opinion. But that's the way I figure. I can help out and still keep working. If they let me alone on this score. I'll do my part in my way. Pops, I come out of a part of the South. Where it ain't no way in the world. You can forget you're colored. My own mother went through hell. Down there. My grandma used to have tears in her eyes. When she'd talk about the lynchings. And all that crap. Even myself, I've seen things. That would make my flesh crawl. But it wasn't a damn thing I could do. About it and keep on breathing. Lewis, how much weight? Have you lost? You're skinny as a rail. Well, ah, uh, I don't know. Around 40, 45 pounds, like that. In a couple of months. Just took it easy, you know, and. What did you do about the wardrobe? Well, I just got rid of it. I mean, it was a pleasure. Why you can't take them up but once. So, I took it up once. And it was still too big. So that was it. Mr. Armstrong. Everybody calls you Lewis. And I hope I can. Yes. You've been very sick. The last couple of years. How you feeling? Well, I feel fine now. You know, and like the old saying, ah. Uh, I've left it all behind me. 
You went into the intensive care unit twice. Twice, yeah, yeah. Did you think your life was coming to an end? A man going into intensive care twice. You know, he's looking right at Gabriel. And he's calling me. He wants to blow a duet with me. But I said, no, daddy. Your your union card ain't straight. I better wait. When I was in the Beth Israel Hospital. Boy, I got boxes and boxes of mail. From everywhere over the waters. Come on, Satch, get out of that bed. And come blow. We're waiting for you. Hello, Louis. This is Enrico. I hope you are getting better. And we are all praying for you. How many more years? Do you think you'll be blowing that horn? Well, I'll be blowing all my life. I mean, that's the way it'll be, you know. And I even if I'll be teaching some kids. Or something, I'll always be around music. Sachmo, you've been everywhere. And done just about everything. Is there anything you haven't done? That you'd like to do? Yeah, keep living. I ain't finished yet. I see trees of green. Red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself. What a wonderful world. I see skies of blue. There's a zillion people who dug that tune. The way I did it when I felt it. Because, ah. Uh, there's so much in wonderful world. That brings me back to my neighborhood. Where I live in Corona, ah, uh, New York. Lucille and I, ever since we married. We've been right there in that block. And everybody keeps their little homes up. Like we do. And it's just like one big family. I saw three generations come up. In them blocks. So that's why I can say. I hear babies cry and. I've watched them grow. They'll learn much more. Than I'll ever know. And I think to myself. What a wonderful world. Yes, I think to myself. What a wonderful world. My doctor came to hear me blow. And he was perfectly satisfied. He examined me thoroughly. To see if my blowing affected. The old ticker, you know. And the beats were perfectly normal. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Louis. Happy birthday to you. This is 770 steps. And ten more steps, I'll be in heaven. It had been my opinion. That Lewis was gonna drop dead. On stage one day. I didn't feel bad about that. Because if he had to go, I think. What better way to go? Than doing the thing you love to do? A lot of us would be very happy. To have accomplished. To the extent that he did. What we originally set out to do. He had all the material things. That he needed, but more importantly. He had the respect. And the love of millions of people. I mean, literally millions. All over the world. What more could any man ask for? The night Lewis passed. I had no idea, this man. He disappointed he was doing so well. It was a shock to me. And he was telling me, he says. You know, I feel good. He says. You know, I've got to get back to work. So that's the mood Lewis was in. On the 5th of July of 1971. Music kept. Lewis, Satchmo, Armstrong rolling. For 71 years. Until this morning when he died. In his sleep in his home in New York. He had been battling heart. And kidney ailments for years. We aren't saying goodbye to Lewis tonight. For a man's music does not die with him. Certainly not this man's. While we can only guess. How Beethoven played the piano. Or Mozart conducted an orchestra. The sounds of Lewis singing, playing. Or just plain talking. Will live as long as there is anyone. To listen. Well, he was. A great artist and a very sweet man. Down to earth, a lovely neighbor. He was a regular. And he just loved to be around people. He was more of a friend. Instead of celebrity in the neighborhood. Bobby Hackett, learn anything from him? 
To me, Pops was truly an immortal man. And the truth of the matter is that he will never die. I think what he left will always be heard all over the world and enjoyed. And a very gentle reminder to everybody to love thy neighbor and cut out the nonsense. He was a man that was beloved with a certain depth and intensity that you cannot fathom. It was cause of how he touched people. Well, folks, that was my life. And I enjoyed all of it. Yes, I did. I don't feel ashamed at all. My life has always been an open book. So I have nothing to hide. Bye bye. Love a plenty. Soul Foodly, Satchmo, Louis Armstrong. This is one number I like to do, folks. And it tells you a whole lot. About my life. I can't tell it all, you know. But let's give you a good synopsis. When I was born long ago. July the 4th, 1900. It was back of town in James Alley. A boy from New Orleans. When I was only five or so. Down Rampart Street I used to go. That's when I heard. The great King Oliver. Blowing jazz from New Orleans. Now folks, all these years. I've had a ball. Oh, thank you, Lord. And I thank you all. You are very kind. To old Satchmo, yes. Nice looking boy, ain't he? A boy from New Orleans.